so I'd love to welcome Greg uh, Shemek. Is that how you pronounce it? I should have asked you before. Yeah, Shemek. That's close. Uh, and uh, he is he's currently the executive director of the Coastal Cutthroat Coalition. Um, he's also one of the founders. Um, he's an avid fly fisherman. Um, he is a past president and if, if I remember correctly, current president of Puget Sound Fly Fishers Club in Tacoma. Um, and he's currently working as a conservation committee chairman. Um, Greg's uh, conversa uh, conservation work was recognized by the WSCFFI and he was awarded the Bill McKay Conservation Award for his work with Coastal Cutthroat Coalition. Um, he's also on the board of directors of the Hood Canal Salmon Enhancement Group, and he uh, volunteers along with WF WDFW, um, assisting coastal cutthroat research. And he's a Lakewood resident. Um, so, with no further ado, Greg, you're up. No, thanks very much, Mark. Uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for for tuning in and 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 wanted to hear a little bit about coastal cut science research here in Washington State. I'm Mark said, uh, I'm born and bred Washingtonian. I'm from Shelton and I kind of started fishing down then in that particular area back in the in the 50s. I think as near as I can recall, I caught my first coastal cutthroat trout in 1958 in Hood Canal and then primarily spent most of my time fishing down in the deep south sound uh, around Shelton and Olympia area for Coastal cutthroat trout. So I've loved this fish for a long time. Uh, the Coastal Cutthroat Coalition, as you'll see, is not really a fishing organization. We're a science organization that's dedicated to the science and research of coastal cutthroat trout so we can better gain data and manage this particular species. So we're going to put up a, get a PowerPoint presentation up to you that's going to kind of cover the coalition, who we are, what we do, how we do it, and then uh, explain some of the science that we found and how that relevant to cutthroat fishing. Like I said, we're not a fishing organization. We're really a science group that's trying to learn. We can uh, hopefully manage this species long, long, long ways into the future. So let's see if we get this presentation up. All right, everybody, we're going to take off and we're going to go a little bit quick. But if you've got some questions, feel free to answer or you know, pop into Mark and I'll try to answer them uh, first of all. So we're going to talk first of all about the Coastal Cutthroat Coalition, uh, the creation of, of the coalition itself. Why, who, how, what, and kind of what we've done. So, and again, we're going to kind of blast through some of these slides. Normally, this is a lot longer presentation, but Coastal Cutthroat is, a, is you know, a fish that's not really studied very much within Washington State, as well as some of the other bodies of water, especially the anadromous life form, and that's what we study. Uh, uh, it's not a commercial fishery, and that's probably a really good thing because if it was commercially fished, that we'd be a, in a lot more difficult situation. But uh, it's our native wild trout in Washington, other than coastal, other than steelhead. So it's a fish of of, of importance to an awful lot of people. Economically, uh, you know, it generates now we think a little over two million dollars in revenue as far as guide trips and and, and materials and on and on and on. So it's a fish that uh, that we want to try to keep around for a long time. And, and so we're dedicated to doing that. So we're kind of going to get into that. So who started the coalition? It was started by this group that you see on the screen right now. Uh, some of you may know Bill Drury, the owner of Peninsula Fly Outfitters or the Peninsula Outfitters in Paulsbo. Uh, great fly shop guy that's really dedicated to the to the to custom cutthroat trout. Uh, James Losey is a fish biologist with WDFW. He's also the director of science and research with, with the organization. Uh, Richard Malzan runs our website and that type of stuff. Leland Milwaukee, some of you may know Leland. He's a longtime guy in Washington, works for, uh, for Orvis. Uh, we've got some other directors now as well. And unfortunately, the guy you see to the right over there, uh, it was one of our directors uh, that you'll see, and he just unfortunately passed away from us. And so... Uh, uh, we really miss him, but this is the group that actually set started the coalition up. Uh, we have a board of directors. I'm the executive director of that. James Losey is the director of science and research. Mark Dalton has our marketing. 
Richard Malzan, like I said, runs the web page. Dwayne Fogergan, I don't know if anybody knows Dwayne or not, but he used to work for Puget Sound Partnership. A scientist and marine biologist has his own shellfish company down in Totten Inlet. Bill Young, who on the right, who unfortunately just passed away, is a director at large. Ted Parker is a Snohomish aquatic guy in uh, Snohomish County. He's one of our directors as well. Uh, we just brought on Keith Robbins, who has going to be our director of finance, and so he's new with us as well. Kind of the group that runs it right now, we're a standalone organization. When we started this organization back in 2015, it was really to try to fund a single particular research project that the Department of Fish and Wildlife wanted to be involved uh, in studying coastal cutthroat trout, but they didn't have the finance. And so they reached out to the group that we just kind of showed and said, is there any way that you could kind of see if we could help finance this project? And uh, so that group took off and, uh, and, and took this on as an endeavor and off we went. And so I'm going to show you kind of how we did that, but it was a, it was a, an impetus from, uh, uh, from a research request from the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And as you'll see as it goes on, one of the things that was really, really important to us was is that if we were going to get involved in finance uh, funding projects, we needed to have a really firm project partner. And uh, you'll see how that progressed. But we reached out to Hood Canal Salmon Enhancement Group as one of the 14 fishery enhancement groups in Washington State and joined partnership with them in 2017. And so this is our board of directors that actually were a standalone group. We run our own finances. It, it, uh, we do all our own work. We work conjunction with biologists from Hood Canal Salmon Enhancement Group because we're in a lot of the same watersheds. But we answer to this board of directors at Hood Canal uh, Salmon Enhancement Group. Uh, so when we decide to do a project or if a project is brought to us for funding, we analyze it among ourselves, look at it, and then we put it before the board of directors of Hood Canal Salmon Enhancement Group to really see if it fits our mission or not, and uh, and get their uh, and get their blessing as well. So everything we do is peer reviewed by a whole other board of directors to make sure that not only is the science correct, but is the financing is correct as well. So we have uh, we have a very very good oversight on anybody's funds that to get donated to our work. The way when we started this thing is we decided we would reach out to to uh, fishing organizations first, so fly clubs. So we went out and targeted fly clubs in Western Washington and spoke to each one of them about the project uh, that we were trying to fund. It was a pit, st pit tag study that was ultimately hopefully going to give us a, a, a population estimate of coastal cutthroat trout in Puget Sound but it addressed a number of different issues to try to reach that particular goal. But uh, those are some of the people that started it off in the beginning, uh, the uh, Olympic Peninsula chapter uh, in Paulsbo, the Olympia chapter TU in Olympia, North Sound chapter up in Bellingham, all were really, really uh, instrumental in getting funds in in the beginning to try to get this off the ground. And then out to other uh, fly clubs that you can see on the, on the bottom. And, and certainly many, many others since then. We've really kind of quickly figured out that we weren't going to reach the sum that we were wanting to try to achieve, which was just right around $100,000 for this project by just kind of speaking to fly clubs. So the second thing that we did is we reached out to the fishing industry. So we went out to guides and fly shops and industry itself uh, it, within the industry, Sage Patagonia were big contributors in the big in the in the beginning, and all of a sudden we started getting more funding that way, and so we were able to keep the project online. Uh, we got involved with earlier. I, uh, I maybe some of you have attended the, uh, the the big fundraiser that we have every January uh, except for the last year. Uh, in Seattle, that's run by a fellow by the name of Keith Robbins, who now is on our board of directors. Uh, and he's been instrumental in raising the majority of the funding along with people that attend his fundraiser every year. Uh, the majority of the funding that we have put together so far uh, for all of the Coastal Cutthroat Coalition's existence has been 
through Keith's generous uh, fundraising efforts and supported by literally hundreds and hundreds of avid coastal cutthroat fishermen. And without them, we wouldn't even be anywhere where we are. Uh, down below, the people on the right-hand side that you can see down here in the corner, my cursor is at, uh, the Gill family in Sumner make some of the most beautiful custom uh, handmade nets that you can imagine and, and big supporters of our organization. So the second phase was to reach out to the angling industry. And then the third phase, we reached it out to the general public. And we have people now from all walks of life, Georgetown Brewery, Mankey Lumber is a big supporter. They have a lot of, a lot of Mankey Lumber's uh, uh, timberland is along the, along the waterways in, in Puget Sound. And, and they uh, are, are great stewards of those waterways. Uh, the Suquamish tribe, the Squaxin tribe, the, uh, the Skokomish tribe have all donated and, and support our efforts. Microsoft has been a matching company for any of their employees. They will match uh, funds donated to us as well. You may, in the picture that you can see, uh, everybody talks about getting a big check, you know, from Publishers House Publishing or whatever it is. Uh, that's uh, that's one of our first big checks in 2019, literally and figuratively. And the fellow on the right hand side is Tom Douglas, uh, renowned chef in Seattle, owner of many restaurants and a huge supporter of the coalition. He puts together a fundraising. He donates uh, many, many uh, dinners with wine from many of his restaurants. And then uh, he puts on a custom lunch that he cooks for a maximum of 25 people that raises an awful lot of money too. So once we reached out to the general public, uh, we started to generate an awful lot more money. Uh, what what are we? Well, our mission statement, like I said, is we're dedicated to the science and management of coastal cutthroat trout. So we're not a fishing organization. We all fish uh, and we love coastal cutthroat trout. And what we're learning certainly helps the fishing community. But hopefully the science that we learn and the data that is gathered will help the fishing community for generations to come. This is again, like I said, our wild coastal cutthroat. Uh, it's one of 14 subspecies of cutthroat in, in Western United States. It's uh, the, the anadromous life form. There's four life forms of, or life histories of coastal cutthroat trout. And we study primarily, exclusively really, the, the anadromous form. Uh, so we do that through a lot of different ways. Projects, volunteer works, we're out speaking to education. Uh, we speak at high schools, we speak at colleges. We speak to numerous different uh, organizations, whether they are fraternal organizations or fishing organizations or Audubon Society. Or, it seems like everybody that's in that's interested in 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 conservation understands what we're trying to achieve. And uh, it's not just preservation of the fish itself; it's preservation of the watersheds that these fish uh, they live in as well. So, as far as fundraising is concerned, it's donations, events. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit later about a, our con current project that we're on that really comes into a grant that we're uh, that we won last year that we're really proud of. We also use social media to reach out. I mean, hopefully some of you have seen us on Instagram and on Facebook, uh, Twitter. We have a website, coastalcutthroatcoalition.com, that you can go to and 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 drop drop in requests or anything that you want. You can converse with us there. All of our projects are listed there. All of our published papers are listed there as well. So we reach out, we use, we use social media a lot. Uh, see, there's some of the, this is Sea Run Cuts, that is uh, uh, Coastal Cuts, some of the posts that have been on there over the years. Uh, we've ran one particular really fun project that we involved the angling community with. Uh, maybe some of you helped with the, the parasite study that's going on it's still going on uh, go to our coastal cutthroat coalition.com and you'll see parasite study on there we're going to touch on it in the presentation but what we did is we had, we involved anglers catching fish to report back how many argulids or coca pod parasites were on fish or not on fish and we put their names into a drawing every month and we pulled a drawing out and they got shirts and mugs and flies and all sorts of stuff for for turning turning the uh, the data in so social media is used a lot this is a copy of a headline of one of the papers that's published that's on our website as well 
this is a, just a little quick shot of the of the argulage study. This is some of the data. We'll see it a little bit later on in more depth. But what 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 the angling community was able to show us is that what months were more cocoa pods caught and in what geographic areas as well. So that's a, a really active, fun social media uh, project that we had going on. Uh, we're really proud to talk about what we do financially. Like I said, we learned, we, we realized early on that if, if we were being entrusted with, with public donations, that that had to be a, a real critical part of our, of, of our, what we do every day. And so, uh, that's why we hooked up with Hood Canal Salmon Enhancement Group because we're part of that 5013C as well. So, but when you look at science, science is expensive, ladies and gentlemen, and and you know, you, you you don't want to. I don't know how you how you say that money is money is important, but money is money is important to what we do, and so. I can see up in the right hand corner that particular little tag that you can see right there is $350 a piece that we use in some fish and the antennas that are used for that down in the lower left hand corner about $2,500 a piece. These readers are about 500 bucks a piece. Uh, nets are incredibly expensive for person we beach seine for the cutthroat trout. So, so science is expensive, but one of the things that we're really proud of is that from the, our inception, all the monies that have been raised, and this is a little bit outdated right now, so some of it's been spent, some of it's unspent. It's really a bigger number now totally because we've uh, uh, achieved more funding since then. But from our inception, all but $275 has been spent exclusively on science. Nobody in the coalition is paid for anything. None of the board of directors are paid for anything. All of the, all of our effort and time is all volunteered. We pay for all our own gas and boats. We pay for all of our gas tra traveling in cars. Uh, we pay for all of our overnight stays when we're speaking to organizations throughout the state. The only money that's been spent that has not gone to fund actual science is 275 dollars and we spent that as a gift uh, that we awarded to keith robbins uh, for appreciation of raising a little over a hundred thousand dollars in four and a half years by himself so everything else has been spent on science itself we keep great records of that uh, we've uh, put on presentations and showed exactly which checks went where so it's something that we're really really proud of uh, so some of the results, I, I, we can kind of stop here a little bit and, and, uh, if anybody has anything that has a question right now about the coalition of how it was found up and who it is and why we formed it up, you can fire that off and I'll be happy to answer any of that, or you can want to wait till the end. We can certainly talk about them. Uh, so if you've got something you want to shoot to Mark, go ahead and, and he can, let me know what that is and if not then we'll go on with some of the results of the science that we've learned okay so uh some of these sites we're going to blast by but just quickly the fish we study is the coastal cutthroat trout so scientifically its name is oncorhynchus clarki clarki it's one of uh like i said 14 subspecies of cutthroat trout in the northwest Genetically, it is the oldest. All the other, there's some, there's some genetic work being done right now in Utah that that may cloud that a little bit. But up until now, right now, it, it's it. All of the other uh, subspecies are offshoots of coastal cutthroat trout. It's the oldest one, and they all genetically share <clears throat> sort of the sort of part of their background with that particular fish. There are four life histories of this fish. It lives in small little streams exclusively, and they're also called resident fish. They live in they they all they all are 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 spawned in tiny little streams, and some stay in that and are resident. Some leave that stream and go to a bigger stream, and stay in that stream. And that life history is called the fluvial life history, which is the kind of the middle fish there. Uh, there's an ad fluvial fish that leaves those streams and goes into a lake like Lake Washington or, or Lake Sammamish and grows there and then goes back and spawns. And then the bottom one is the anadromous life form. And it's truly not anadromous in the form of large distance uh, 
migration like the Pacific salmon do. This this fish is a near shore, uh, a migrating fish. 25 miles inland is about as far as it ever leaves its natal stream. On the coast, we found them out about 60 miles, uh, but that's the extent of their of, of their migration. The graph on the right that you see is uh, uh, a graph that is from the Trask River, Oregon, but it represents work that was done not only in BC, but in, 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 in uh, California and Washington at the same time periods. And what we know just by that graph is we have fewer coastal cutthroat trout now than we used to. Uh, that's just a fact. Now, why? That's part of the reason that the coalition was found up. We wanted to try to learn more about why we don't have as many and and uh, and what we can do to try to get some of those fish back. Thankfully, uh, the, the Department of Fish and Wildlife in 1999 went to catch and release in the marine environment only. And with what we know now data-wise over the last five and a half, almost six years, had they not done that in 1999, it's questionable whether we would have very many cutthroat trout around right now. We thought that it was probably retention fishery in 1999 that drove that precipitous drop off and that started occurring earlier. But when we went to catch and release in 99, as you can see from the graph, there was no measurable increase in populations once they went to catch and release. So it had to be something different than that. And we knew, and now we have some speculation to what we think because of the science that we've got, we think we have a handle on what may have dropped that thing down where it went down. And, and the recovery is just very, very slow because of habitat degradation. But we can talk about that just a little bit more. This is the, this is the, the range of coastal cutthroat trout. They are only from the Eel River in Northern California to Southeast Alaska. It's the only place in the world that this fish exists. And the biggest populations are in Puget Sound, parts of BC, and a little bit of in southeast Alaska. The rest of the areas are very smaller or much smaller populations. Greg, I've got one quick question if you don't mind. Sure. So David asked, is there a specific desired goal that the coalition is working towards? Population size increase or expansion of habitat? So the ultimate goal, our ultimate goal is to try to determine a population of cutthroat trout within greater Puget Sound. That that's that that's the ultimate goal. So, you know, they're the only fish that, uh, at least in the in the in the marine environment, the only uh, uh, regulation on them is, is catch and release. You can catch them 12 months of the year, uh, fish for at least fish for them 12 months of the year. Uh, and and so we don't really know how much fishing impacts, how much habitat impacts, how much uh, uh, pollution may impact the total population. So until we get an estimate of, of population. It's really hard for the department to manage that in any meaningful way. So our ultimate goal is to try to determine a population base within Puget Sound so that we can determine best fisheries management for that. Did that answer his question? Yeah, I think that was great. Thanks. Okay. So this is just kind of the study area uh, that we that we that we represent where we're going to work. So. Uh, we're going to talk about a few different things. We're going to talk about spawn timing the, the, in, in looking for this population basis. How, how do we figure out how many there are? Well, uh, one of the ways to do that in, in kind of in fish science is, is to try to figure out, you know, how many fish there, how many fish it takes to make a spawning red. So when they spawn and they dig their red, just like any fish does, how many fish does that take? Is it just two? Is it a male and a female? Is it a male and uh, or a female and multiple males? So there's ways that you try to study that. First of all, you have to figure out when they spawn. And there's speculations of when they spawned, and that's what's in the books now. But we have been walking some streams. We is usually termed, a term usually used. The department and the coalition and others have been walking certain research streams for the past 16 years now, 17 years. So we've got some real hard data, and you'll show you that in just a, just a, in just a little bit. So you can you can use fish per red to try to get a population estimate, uh, and so that that's part of it. So why we were doing that, then we also 
spun off and found out much more information that, that we're going to share with you. But the study area that was originally done was in the Deep South Sound, and it was done primarily on three streams. So McLean Creek, which feeds Eld Inlet, Kennedy Creek, which feeds Totten Inlet, and Skookum Creek, which feeds Little Skookum Inlet. Since then, now we've expanded that out. But this is where the original study work was done. So you'll see these colors through different presentations. The black dots that you see, those are spawning areas in those streams. So you can see that the spawning length is kind of the same in most of those streams. These streams are very, very close together. Uh, they're about the same type of gradient. And then you can see out the squares that you can see, these are areas where we beach sand. There are six of those areas now. This is kind of, this is when it first kind of started out. But these colors are going to become important as well. This green, this blue, in this in this red. So the first thing that we wanted to do when we got this study going is is that we wanted to find out if there was genetic diversity between the populations in these streams. Now there's other streams that come in. Goldboro Stream comes in in Shelton, right in here. Uh, Mill Creek comes into Hammers Inlet somewhere right in here. Elson Creek is another tiny little stream that comes into Skookum Inlet right in here. Snyder Creek comes in right into this area as well. So there's numerous different streams. But what we did is we went into these we went into these streams and we took genetic samples out of those those streams. And we got juvenile fish. So these cutthroat when when they're spawned, they stay in the fresh water for two years. Generally, they stay in the water for two years the fresh water. They grow to be about six inches long, seven inches maybe, before they move out into the marine and water if they in fact do that. Some do, some choose to stay in the in the, in the fresh water and, and just become fluvial fish. They all have the ability to, uh, to, to, to go into the salt water if it's not blocked by some form, but not all of them do. And I think that's a life preservation thing that some stay in the salt water, some stay in the fresh. They transit back and forth. They can spawn multiple times, of course, just like steelhead. But what we did is take these samples out of these streams, and then we gave the samples to the geneticists. And uh, as you'll see in just a little bit, what we found was is that different than the five Pacific salmon species, which genetically are really a single genome, if you will, these fish are genetically distinct between stream to stream to stream. So they're all Oncorhynchus clarki clarki, uh, coastal cutthroat trout, but genetically they are distinct between these two streams and spawning wise, they will not go into each other's streams to spawn. Now that's not to say there isn't some stream switching if a stream becomes unfertile for whatever reason, if it loses a population, it can over time, be repopulated by a, 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 one, one, one group of fish from somewhere. But as long as there is a spawning population in these streams, they don't share each other's streams. Now they will go into each other's streams other times of the year for numerous reasons. We think for thermal cooling down, for possible parasite shedding, there's a lot of different things. But during spawning, they're very, very loyal to their stream. So. A lot of different ways that we do some of this work. Uh, this is just some of the just regular type normal fish science. Uh, so, you know, tagging with pit tags, which are here, tagging with floy tags, which are here, jaw tags, which are here. This is very important in, in what we've learned about some of their behavioral characteristics. Of course, we can age fish with their scales, and we can also tell whether they've spawned or not. Genetics through fin clipping, of course. So let's look at spawn timing quickly. It gets, this can get a little bit geeky if you want. This is just showing what a pit tag looks like or what a pit looks like when they spawn. Just much, much smaller than steelhead and, of course, salmon. So a big a big red would be probably about the size of a basketball. Normal, normal reds are probably about the size of a cantaloupe. But what I want to show quickly here is that, so a couple of different things. On the left is the scale. This is red counts in what we call Skookum Creek. It's a, a, it is a, a creek down by Shelton. And you can see that an average is around 100 reds per year. Okay, Some years uh, more, 
Uh, some years less, but there's about an average in that stream of about 100 reds per year. And then we'll bring that up a little bit later. But what you can see over on the right-hand side is that the spawning in those streams prior to this study work was always thought that they spawned somewhere between December and far February, maybe March at the latest. Uh, and that was really, really done more anecdotally because cutthroat were in the same were in the streams during those months and you can physically see them when the salmon were in there so the assumption was that they were actually spawning at the same time but what we know is that physiologically these fish are not big and as big as salmon or steelhead and so they don't spawn in those same rivers they spawn in tributaries to those rivers or in some of the tiny little small streams like chum salmon inhabit but much higher up in the stream where the water and actual gravel is much, much smaller and the flow is much less. And so we know now, just kind of quickly going through this, the spawning cycle for cutthroat trout is much, much more prolonged than we thought. It generally starts in the latter part of January, first part of February, but it's protracted as long as the middle of June. And that's really, really new science. That's been published, uh, peer reviewed, and people are amazed that it goes that long. And so it's interesting that year by year, it may peak in, in February, like here. It may peak as late as you know March. It may be here more towards the end of May. Here it may be, uh, again, March in this area. But within, them, with, but within that, you can see there's peaks and there's valleys. And this was really hard for us to understand for a while. Uh, but what we decided to do was what would drive that? Why, why would some months produce more than others? So we went back and we also studied flow of these streams at the same time. And so we put a chart over. And so the blue, the blue is... Uh, is water flow in the red is spawning reds counted at the same time. And so what you can see is that if you have high water flows, like in 2012 here, if you have high water flows, we have very low red counts. 2013 on the converse, you can see a really low water flow area here, and you have you have much higher red counts. And again, we think this is just nothing due to nothing more than the than the physiology size of the fish. They just can't stand high water flows. They need enough water to move their gravel, but too much water moves too much gravel, and of course, they can't build the red that way. So, this is this is this is really new science, and this will be in books from now on. That the spawn timing is, is is much longer than we thought. So, for anglers, so you like you folks that are watching tonight, what's this re what's this mean? Well. If you were setting management of streams to open a stream fishing season, and you were pretty sure that fish were done spawning in March, then if you opened fishing in May, you wouldn't have any spawning fish around and the fish would already be out of the reds and, and be free swimming. But what we know now is if you open streams for fishing in the end of May, like we do in Washington, and it happens to be a stream that has retention of two fish over 14 inches, then you very likely could be catching and killing uh, spawning cutthroat trout. And also, uh, if you're wandering around wading streams in late May, early June, you could certainly still be walking over spawning uh, spawn reds and, and dislodging eggs as well. So, so there's a real ramification of uh, learning about the fact that these fish on much later. Uh, again, just quick slide that just shows higher water flows, lower red counts. And this red count thing is important because that's how we're going to try to get to the uh, abundance of, of, of fish in Puget Sound at one point in time. So let's look quickly at marine movement. Uh, we know they travel more in the summer than they do at any other time. The rest of the time, they're very close to the, what the, their natal beach. So we'll go back to this again. So we know, we know that, that these fish are d genetically distinct within these streams. So the next part of the study was to let's go out in the marine environment 
and will catch fish in the marine environment, hook and line wise, and also beach seine wise, and we'll take genetic off of these fish, and then we'll compare those genetics to the freshwater genetics, and we'll find out which streams these fish came from, okay? So again, it's a small sample. This is an older slide, and, uh, and so the, the numbers are really, really high. They've come down some now that we've been able to do this for numerous years, but it's still, uh, it, it's still shocking. So this just goes to show you conservation-wise why, why streams really need to be protected, why we need to be concerned about water quality and streams throughout Puget Sound, whether they are in downtown Seattle, coming in through gulches, whether they're in Snohomish County, whether they're coming off uh, in, in the Paulsbo area, whether it's, whether it's Hood Canal, wherever it is, these tiny little small streams that seem so innocuous, they all have they all have cutthroat populations in them. Small, some, others bigger than others, some surprising. So let's just look at what we've seen. So what we found was is that Skookum Creek in the green, when we went out and took the samples, and you'll see this, so Skookum Creek is responsible for 77% of all the fish in that initial study that we caught were all from one stream. McLean caught the next, but it was only 17%. Kennedy Creek only had 2% of the fish we caught, and then 3% for, from other streams that we hadn't sampled. So what we know is that there's mixed stock fishery in the Deep South Sound, but Skookum Creek's dispor disproportionately really, really high. So... Uh, one of the things about Skookum Creek is, is when you saw a previous slide, if we average 100 reds in that stream, and let's just say, and we're still working on this total of fish red, fish in the stream for red count, and we do that with pit tag, and you'll see that in just a second. But if there's 100 reds in there, and it's two fish per red, that's only 200 adult fish that populate Skookum Creek, and it represents 77% of the fish that were caught in the Deep South Sound. That's how important that particular stream is. The other question then is, of course, is how about Kennedy Creek? How about McLean Creek? Why don't they produce? So that's some of the stuff that, we, that we're trying to figure out. So uh, again, uh, and these are just months that we catch different fish when we're beach seining. When do we catch the bigger fish? Generally in the winter. Uh, you can see that, that November, December, January, February time, those fish are generally really feeding heavily to get ready for their spawn time in February, March, April, May, June, that period. So, uh, so one of the things that we did uh, during this initial study when we found when we, when we found that these fish were doing what they were doing <clears throat> and we wanted to know that we knew where these fish were coming from, but what was strange was we were finding them on in the same areas all the time. And this particular slide you can see right here, this was our initial tagging process of a, of a, of a characteristic that's now being called high site fidelity. So these are little elastomer jaw tags. This is put in with a syringe. You put a different color in every month that you catch these fish. So when we would go out to those sites that we showed you earlier, the little black boxes, and we would beach stain those, set, those, those sites, what we found was is these fish will populate a particular beach when they leave the fresh water. So when they're two years old and they leave the fresh water, they will populate a particular beach and they'll live there their whole life, except when they leave in the summer to go out and travel around for whatever reason but they'll come back to that beach in about August and get ready to start building up before they head up into spawn again in that February, March period that they come back and they, they let, they, they stay on the same beach. And some of these fish that we've caught, we've caught eight and nine times. They had so many tags in them. They looked like a Christmas tree. The next stuff. Uh, and, and this is just kind of showing how that works. So if you look at this quickly, we'll go through it because I know we're running out of time and I want, I, I need you guys need to ask some questions, but so here's a fish that was caught in November on a particular beach. It was caught on the same beach in December. And then we didn't see it again until April. So, but what we know was is that in March, we found it up in the spawning area because it had a tag in it and it went over an antenna in the tag. So it told us that it was, it, it was up there in March. And then of course it left and it came, it came back onto the same beach that it was caught on. So, 
here's Totten Inlet Beach. So it left, it, it was born in Skookum Creek. It left its natal, natal area of Skookum Inlet. It lives over in Totten Inlet. It travels around, but it keeps coming back here till it's time to spawn. Then it goes back and it spawns. Then it came back to that same that same beach again in April. And then uh, it spawned in March and it came back in April. And then in February, the following year, we actually found that fish deceased up in Skookum Creek. So we've done this with no, many, many fish. We can go through a lot of different fish. Uh, we've got almost, almost 3,000 fish captured now. The capture rate's about 22%. We're catching these same fish uh, on the beaches in marine movements of wise. And, and so catching these same fish off the same beach, uh, and this is just another deal. This is a fish that was tagged numerous times and, to, uh, and out in the salt water uh, off its beaches. And then we found it back in the marine water. So what we call this is we, we call this high site fidelity. And, and again, what it really means is, is that when these fish leave the fresh water and go out into the marine environment, they will find a beach that they like for whatever reason. And you can have 10 beaches that look exactly the same and only one of them will, will have a population of trout on it. And interestingly enough, generally these populations over the years are from the same stream. Now, I don't know how fish tell each other where to go to live, but it's kind of a crazy situation. But, you know, anglers have favorite beaches they go and fish for. I have beaches that I grew up fishing, and they still have fish on them. And I have friends that say, oh, I got a beach that I can go fish, and I can always catch fish there. So that can give you a sense of, of a lot of fish. But what we know now tagging-wise, either with jaw tags or pit tags or floy tags over this last five and years, five and a half years, is that, these are populations indeed, small populations, but anglers are actually catching the same fish over and over on that same beach. They're not transient fish that are going through like schools of salmon. They actually live on that beach. So the ramifications of that for the angling community is, if you don't practice good catch and release methods, if you drag fish up on the beach, if you don't use nets to net the fish, and we lose any of those fish through hooking mortality, or simply because you fight fish and you let them go and they build up lactic acid, they're much more prone to predation from seals, and from otters, from uh, ospreys, from eagles. Uh, so this is another thing that's been published and that paper is on the website as well. And it talks about this high site fidelity. So it makes these fish a lot more vulnerable if they're being fished on day after day on the same beach. This is one thing that that's come up in the study that's a little bit concerning uh, and uh, it's a lot concerning really when we take scale samples off these fish that scale sample will actually tell us the age of the fish and it'll tell us how many times they've spawned and one of the things that we've seen over the last number of years is that we see fish that have spawned, should have spawned numerous times have have not spawned at all or uh, have only spawned one time. Uh, so, but you're going to go through this really quickly. So the different colors that you can see is how many times a fish has spawned. You can see length and stuff here of different sizes of fish, how many we counted of those fish, and how many times they spawned in the size of these fish. Of course, bigger uh, millimeters, bigger fish that way. There was a study that was done in 87 or 89 and by, the, by the department themselves, and what they found in that was is fish of the same age class and physical size had spawned numerous times where we didn't even find some of the fish as big as now as we found back then. And even the ones we did were not spawning at all or only spawning one time. We don't have an answer for that right now, ladies and gentlemen, but it's something that's, that's being proved out throughout Puget Sound. And this is a this is a really big concern, and uh, it, there, there certainly work needs to be done on it. But this is this is some of the science that comes out of the work that we're doing to try to ultimately determine uh, fish per count. In uh, the way that we can really, the way that we can justify saying this and, and publishing these papers is because you know scale samples are, you know, the scale samples right here. You, it's part science and it's part it's part art reading reading to find this to find the spawning. Uh, mark on that. But in the fish, there's a bone called an otolith, and it's in the ear of the fish itself right in here. 
Unfortunately, of course, we can't cut kill cutthroat trout because that's the only way you can get the otolith bone out. But it's a recording device within the fish that will tell us almost to the day when it was born. It'll tell us whether its mother was from the salt water or from the fresh water. Uh, it will tell us its age. It will tell us how many times it spawned. Uh, and so what we did a couple of years, about a year and a half ago, is we collected 50 dead cutthroat over about a two-year period uh, while we were walking salmon streams for salmon red counting, cutthroat red, cut, red counting, uh, or if we just, if, if unfortunately we lost a fish during, during the research work. And we sent those fish to, uh, we, we, took, we took the otolith bone out and we took scale samples out. We sent them to the University of Oregon and they did a, a, a study where there's a, a, a chemical called stratonium, which is deposited be, when they leave fresh water and go to salt water and vice versa. And there's only two places in the U.S. that can do that. That's in Oregon State and back on the East Coast. And what they found was is that, yes, indeed, our scale sampling was correct. Uh, this is what you can see. This is this is one side of, of the otolith, and this is the other side of the otolith. But this is showing that they came, they went, in, they went into the fresh water and came out to the salt water. And it also shows that mark here. And this is the maternal mark. So this was actually a, 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 a fish that was spawned, spent time in the marine water, came back and spawned. And so this fish had a marine life mother. Uh, went to migration to sea, and there's a maternal signal, of course. Here's one without a maternal signal, and so she was, this this fish went out to sea, but it came back uh, as, uh, from, it, it was actually spawned from a, from, from a mother in the freshwater. And about, now about 20% of the fish we, we find now have, have, have uh, freshwater, uh, have, have freshwater mothers. Uh, parasites. I'm I'm, I'm going to kind of blast through this because uh, you know I don't know how much long how much time we have on this. This is this parasite study that we talked about. This is the parasite that we're concerned about. This is called an argulid argulid pacificitis. This is a cocopod, normally called sea lice. The thing that's dangerous that we see right now is this is on all species of of, of fish. Uh, they, they can be on cod. They can be on salmon. They can be on steelhead. This particular parasite is coastal cutthroat specific. It's not on anything else. And uh, it's getting to be a big concern. I don't know how clear this picture is, but there's about 55 of these parasites on this particular fish. The biggest we've found so far is 111. Uh, lots of fish now have at least 20 or 30. And this has really increased since about 2013. And we think it has something to do with water temperature, but we're not sure yet. Still an ongoing study, but this is what some of the funding helps fund as well. So this parasite thing is a is a concern. I'll end just part of it with what, what we're doing right now. People say, okay, what are you going to spend money on right now? Well, right now we're on a project called the Big Fjord Project. It's in Hood Canal. Hood Canal, uh, is, of course, is the largest fjord in, in the United States. Uh, it has lots of freshwater streams. So... What we did is we, uh, the, the goals are to find out that in seven, we, we looked at 17 different watersheds in Hood, in Hood Canal. So we took juvenile genetic samples out of 17 watersheds in Hood Canal, north, south, east, and west. And what we want to do is we want to find out if they're genetically distinct like they were in the South Sound. We want to find out their migration patterns. How far do they travel up and down the canal? Do they cross the canal from east and west? And by doing that same analysis, we've already taken all the freshwater samples, genetically wise, and now we're in the process of collecting marine samples. We will compare those. We will find out which streams are more productive than others, and then we will finish, vi we'll visit those streams and find out if there needs to be restoration work done in those streams. Uh, and what we've done is is that we've this is a really unique project. It was started. Uh, by the coalition to try to just determine all that, what we talked about. Uh, but for this is the first time we've actually involved anglers in the science side of, the, of, of any of our work. And so, like I said, there's 17 watersheds and there are seven different geographic areas in the canal. So we took samples out of the freshwater just with our own biologists 
and now we're taking samples out of the out of the salt water and we're using the guide community to the supply boats uh, we have the angling community in the boats and we have a biologist in the boats as well taking the genetic samples and so we just have done ended the first quarter of sampling these seven areas we ended up we thought it was going to be kind of a no-brainer because uh, we're only taking six fish out of each particular geographic area January, February, pretty crummy weather months, so we really had to try to slam it in March. We ended up about four fish short of the goal, uh, but we learned a lot. And so hopefully in the second quarter and third quarter and fourth quarter, we'll be a little bit more efficient. Uh, but that's the ongoing project. It's funded jointly by the Coastal Cutthroat Coalition, as well as our first time grant from NOAA, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. We were one of five grantees in 2021. Uh, over 700 people applied, and we were uh, uh, awarded a grant uh, to carry out this particular project to involve the, the fishing community. So what we'll do is the fishing people that are involved in this will also be involved in the stream restoration work that we find that needs to be done in, uh, in 2022. So that's our current project this is what we'll do some stream restoration uh so we're going to get to questions and and kind of just getting back to the last question as far as population we still don't have an answer yet on fish per red uh in our study streams we've had it at about 1.8 1.35 we've had it at about 2.4 2.5 uh males to females but uh even if we end up with two, even if we end up with two fish per red, and one of your most productive streams only has a hundred reds or two hundred adult fish, then think about streams that all of you folks know. Think about streams that you maybe fish uh, that enter into the sound, or tiny little stream fish streams in the Inner Hood Canal, like Shoefly Creek, or Little Shoefly Creek, or Tawana Creek, or Eagle Creek, or Jorstead Creek. They may have populations of only 10 or 20 or maybe 30 adult fish. So when you start thinking about streams in, in other states that have seven and eight and 9,000 fish per mile that get fished on, uh, we just don't think there are right now, we don't think that we can say there are a lot of coastal cutthroat trout. And we know areas where they are there all the time, uh, but we know now they're the same fish and that has, that has some ramifications. So I know it was really quick. Uh, this presentation is almost generally a couple hours long, but uh, you can fire off any questions, however much time we have, Mark. I don't know how much time, but uh, I certainly appreciated the opportunity to speak with you folks and uh, certainly feel free to fire anything to it. I'll try to answer it as best I can. Um, so one question David had was, um, do the tribes express much interest in cutthroat? Have the tribes? Yeah. So the, the tribes that I've talked to, certainly commercial, uh, commercially, no. Do they take some of the bigger fish when they're seining? Uh, especially in, in the canal, there are some, some very large cutthroat. Uh, interestingly enough, we talk about size-wise of fish. We have yet to beach sane a 20-inch fish. And I know some of the guides have caught fish much over, much over 20. I think the state record is 24 inches that's recorded. Uh, personally, I have, I've, I've caught one 21, but that was in an estuary stream, so it wasn't it doesn't count in the salt water. Uh, but to answer that question, the the tribal fishermen that I've talked with just personally have no, uh, you know, they admire the fish, they know it's there in their gill nets when they are gill netting. You know, 99% of the fish, uh, coastal cutthroat trout, make it through a gill net that they're just not big enough. And unfortunately, if you're catching one in a gill net that's it's that large, it's really at its end of life. You hate to lose that big of a fish, but certainly genetically that fish should have spawned numerous times. But as far as commercial aspect, no tribe that I've talked to for, so I've talked with the, the Suquamish tribe, uh, the Squaxin tribe, the Lummi tribe, uh, the Stoke tribe, uh, the squawks and tribe; those five tribes have no have no interest in a commercial fishery on it that they've expressed to me. Um, another question was um, when you were talking about the parasites, uh, maybe some clarity on like how do those parasites um, 
affect the fish? Is it increasing mortality or uh, is it, you know, they're breeding, there's just more of them or what happens with, with that? That's a great question. It's a great question. We get asked every time we put the presentation on the same thing. And I have to just say right now, we don't know exactly what, how it affects the fish. We know just in parasitic science, any parasite on any type of a host is not a healthy situation. Uh, but, you know, when these fish are caught, they swim away. We know that they really attack themselves on, on another presentation just on present on parasites when we when you can see the underside of this parasite it's frighteningly like it looks like something out of some kind of a scientific movie it's 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 certainly it's, it's calcium it's, it's cal calcified biting material actually it adheres itself onto the to the cutthroat and we recommend people not trying to take them off because if you do that you can actually the, the fish will actually react to trying to have that that parasite taken off so we don't know what they do. We know that it's probably not healthy. We know that it's increasing. And one of the things I'll just, just quickly touch on is when we talked about trout, close to cutthroat trout, going into streams in the summer period when you would think they should be in the salt water, and all past science will tell you they're in the salt water. We, we find during walking those streams in the summer, fish that are really big fish that shouldn't necessarily not be there and certainly when when the lower south sound heats up they will go into freshwater streams as a thermal refuge to try to cool down actually when we snorkel some of those streams i've actually seen them lay on their side and put their gill plates right on springs to watch to try to get as much spring water as they can to help cool down but these parasites that are on coastal cutthroat trout exclusively cannot live in fresh water and we've done that by taking parasites off of a of a coat throat putting them in what we call a, a, a fotarium it's a plexiglass box where you can take pictures of them filling that with salt water and these parasites will adhere in the, they will adhere to the side of the fotarium and bring them home dump that out put fresh water in there and within a matter of minutes they're dead so one of the things that we think we're seeing with these large cutthroat, because we never see cutthroat in the fresh water with parasites on them, except cocoa pods. And cocoa pods is typically sea lice, but we never find argulids in the fresh water. So we think that these big fish may go into these streams uh, as a way to, to unload parasites. I, that's speculation right now, but uh, as far as what they do, we don't have an answer of what they do. We just know that they're cutthroat specific. In Canada, they found them on a couple other species, but down here, we don't find them on Atlantic salmon in the pens. We don't find them on any of the five Pacific salmon. Uh, we don't find them on, on, on any forage fish as well. So uh, we just know that it's not good for them and it's increasing, but we don't know why. So follow up on that was, are these parasites more prevalent in certain or specific specific areas of uh, Puget Sound? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's another really, really good question. And and again, some of the data is a little bit skewed because we may not have anglers fishing in all the areas in Puget Sound, or if they are, they may or may not be reporting argulids. But of the anglers that report finding argulids on coastal cutthroat trout, Area 10, so that Seattle area, certainly seems to be uh, the area that has 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 the highest concentration. So we don't know if there is a uh, if there is a uh, uh, a pollution component to it yet or not. But but uh, Area 10 and even parts of 11 down towards Tacoma seem to be areas that have more than than the rest of Puget Sound. Um, we had another question here. So uh, this was, I caught a drone video of a massive school of cutthroat on Hood Canal recently, and I was blown away. It's grainy footage, yet I had no idea. Any info on this behavior, rare or only in the springtime during chum fry? So can you, read so that, I guess, can you repeat that one just again? Yeah, so uh, one of the users um, caught a video of a massive school of cutthroat. Um, and was curious about if you notice this kind of behavior, sort of schooling, um, or is it 
during certain times of year, like when the chum fry are happening or yeah, any info about that? Gotcha. Okay. Yep, absolutely. So, you know, with what, with this, with this, it's interesting. So in the summertime, in the summertime, for some reason, like I said, these fish travel there most and we will, and, and if we encounter them someplace, either hook and line wise or for randomly trying to beach sand a, a beach, we find mixed stock in that area. So I don't know the fact that they're all on Creek is Clark. I Clark. I, they're all cousins, of course, but you know, I don't know if they're on holiday and they, and they kind of get together. So you'll see fish kind of mass up there, but the schooling certainly takes place where they're, where they're feeding. And Certainly chum fry exodus or pinks when the pinks come out as well, uh, they will certainly be in an area, but they are on a lot of those beaches at, in that way more times than you think they are. Uh, one just quick anecdotal story. They were the, the department was was uh, beach sanding one day down in Eldon Let at the Evergreen State Beach, which is a public beach where you can go fish. There was a gentleman there fishing. He'd been fishing for about four hours and pulled in the boat and said, you know, we'd like to kind of set our nets. And he said, fine, uh, there's nothing here. I've been fishing four hours, haven't had a strike. Um, they pulled the net. The first net, I think they got like 62 fish or something. So so there was definitely a population of, of cutthroat on that beach. They just, weren't, wow. they, just, they just didn't like what he had. But certainly, you know, any, any prey fish is going to go after, you know, a, a forage fish and 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 when if you can find schools of of uh, of chum or small anchovies down in the deep south sound uh, it, the fish will certainly congregate around there so it's not a it's not an unusual thing to happen but it's pretty it's pretty oh. unusual to see it but uh it, it if you're there you're pretty lucky i'd love to see the video um another question from Bao. um in our fishing forums you hear a lot about the difference in uh, number and timing of cutthroat in the North Sound versus the South Sound. Is there any science that provides any insight in these perceived differences? Okay, the, just the first part of that again about the time. Um, in our fishing forums, you hear a lot about the difference oh. in the number and timing of cutthroat in the North Sound versus the South Sound. Okay, time timing of what? Timing of spawning or timing of, of successful fishing or I, I don't I know. I think that. successful fishing. Like um, you know, yeah. people talk about like, oh, you know, this time's not a very good time of the year to fish yeah. for sea runs in the North Sound or yeah. you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So I think I think what we see behavior wise in and we in certainly, you know, talking to long time cutthroat fishermen throughout the sound and numerous guides. There are times of the year it's better just in general. So, uh, and again, it depends on where you're at. If you, you know, if you do have streams that have have an out migration of chum fry, that's going to be good. That's going to be good anywhere. It, it, interestingly enough, you know, uh, the chum fry come out kind of in the middle of cutthroat spawning generally. So they they're ultra hungry. They've gone up. They've spawned. It's tough on them. Uh, certainly much tougher on the females, but that's just kind of a generality thing. I think is quite unfair in life, but uh, so they're really hungry. They're coming out. So that, that out migration time, April, May, that period of time when the chum fry are coming out, probably anywhere where you've got anatomy streams, you're going to, you're going to, it's going to be fairly decent fishing. It's not going to be good fishing prompt almost anywhere in the sound. Now that, and that some of the guides, uh, they, they they wouldn't they wouldn't not necessarily dispute this, but th they are able to find fish a little bit uh, more successfully, I think, than than most of us anglers. But during the winter, during the summer months, so June, July, that period, it's tough anywhere. That's when they leave their beaches and travel for whatever reason. So. If you're fishing for cutthroat almost anywhere in Puget Sound during the summer, you're going to find them. You're going to, if you're, if you're, especially in a boat and you're running around, there's areas where you're going to find fish. And if you can find them where they kind of are ganging up and having a holiday, the much, not so much the better. But uh, certainly, you know, uh, August, September, October, November, December, those periods are generally good anywhere. Uh, I think the upper canal. I, I mean the Upper Puget Sound area and uh, uh, and some of the and some of Hood Canal. 
is just a little bit harder fishing in general than the deep south sound. The shorelines are so much different. You know, you got to remember these guys are these guys are uh, you know stream fish by birth. They spent their first two years in a stream. So even when they're in the salt water, they kind of still like to hunt and fish that way. So if you have points and little corners and drop offs and little curves that the deep south sound has all the way through, you know, from down to Shelton, all through Olympia, Case Inlet, Car Inlet, you know, Bainbridge Island, all that. The shorelines are really, really convoluted and it offers great habitat for fish. When you get up into 10 and you get into, into certainly the north part of um, almost all of Hood Canal, those areas are so linear, those beaches don't necessarily lend themselves as well of, of, of facilitating what we see in the deep south sound that's not to say that you don't have beaches up north as well that people know that they can go to i think they're just fewer so uh, uh i i just personally know more uh, no no more folks who catch fish i don't think it's because there are more fish down more guys fish down here or not i just th i just think the habitat in, in in central and lower sound is is, is is better for cutthroat than than the north sound and uh, we're, we, we're, I think we're going to be in Snohomish County within the, within the very near future because, uh, you know, on the outside of Whidbey Island, hardly anything gets caught until you get down to the south end of the outside and then the inside corner, uh, the east, end of, uh, east side of Whidbey. And we think those fish come possibly out of streams from the mainland. And so that, that's an area we're going to study. But we don't know as much about the North Sound as, as, as well. But, but certainly beach-wise, just going up there myself and fishing with guys, just targeting beaches were just not anywhere near as successful. Uh, another question was, do cuts have a higher thermal tolerance in freshwater than salmon in areas where they overlap? I think he means in salt water, but I think certainly they, when the, when the deep south sound and when Hood Canal really starts to warm up, like I said, that's when we start to see fish moving into into streams where you would not think that they should be uh and if and so there's certainly a thermal refuge that i mean they don't like they don't like warm water now that's not to say that you know you haven't caught fish in water that's 70 degrees on hood canal because i have i don't necessarily target them when the water gets that hot uh but i mean we've been out fishing off the mouth of hama hama and, and picking up fish in the summer that uh, a cutthroat that you know just randomly casting flies while we're salmon fishing and uh i but i i, I personally don't i can't tell you the, the water temperature tolerance between salmon and cutthroat trout i don't i don't personally know that um here's a sort of angling uh question um cutthroats seem to be a tr uh, let me put this up um cutthroats seem to be attracted to many european sea trout flies have you heard this before <laughs> No, I haven't heard that before, but what I could say is cutthroat are attracted to just about anything that looks like they can eat. Uh, there was a study done, and uh, I don't think it's on our website right now. I don't, I, don't, I don't think it is. But I have a good friend who did his master thesis on the diet of coastal cutthroat trout. And their diet is about as varied as a human is. So just think about... They eat sculpins, they eat shiner perch, they eat anchovy, they eat small herring, they eat sticklebacks, they eat large carpenter ants, they eat clam necks, they eat ghost shrimp. Uh, the, the diet is really, really varied, to say the least. So pattern-wise, anything that kind of looks edible if you use marabou in, in, in your flies, it has a lot of movement. It's really, really attractive. Uh, anything that's bait fish wise. So certainly, you know, Atlantic salmon flies, I, you, there's, there's a multitude of anything that would look like a small bait fish. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's not a game to them. It's a game to us. For them, they're just trying to make a living. If, it's look, if it looks edible, they're more than likely going to eat it. I can, I'll never forget the time, uh, everyone, I was fishing with one of my very close friends down in Totten Inlet. And 
I've always kind of been a stickler for realistic type patterns. I love, I, I tie stuff that's pretty realistic. And I was getting out fished by this good close friend of mine from kindergarten on. And I yelled to him what he was using. And he said, I don't know what I'm using, but it's, a, it's just a white fly. And I, I was just shocked. I, I, at, at that point in time, I, I said, a white fly? And why would you be using a white fly? And uh, so he said, well, I bought it up in Port Angeles at Waters West Fly Shop. And they said, it's really, really a good fly. Well, I mean, he caught five or six feet fish off that beach at in, 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 in his place, and I and, and I caught like one. So as soon as I got home, I called Waters West and tried to describe this fly. And so many of you people will already know what it is. It's it's Jeff Delia's conehead squid. And so it's a squiddy type pattern. It's made out of kind of uh, the, the, the white, white crystal flash type material. Uh, uh, got a conehead, got a marabou tail on it. And I, I just, I was just amazed. Since then, I've tied about four or five different patterns that are white, and especially in the winter, they are incredibly effective. So, uh, other times I've been out, and people have been just being really successful with an olive woolly bugger. So, uh, I, I just really, when they're hungry, they are not specific. I can tell you though, like when the chum fry come out, uh, they will target Bob Triggs chum baby pattern really 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 well because that's what they're really they're just they're just tied into that pretty much like pacific salmon. a lot of times when you're fishing for pacific pacific salmon the size of the herring if you're using cut plug herring if they're feeding on tiny little two inch stuff you can put four and five inch stuff out there they won't even touch it they're really really size specific i don't think cutthroat are really very very specific so i think any of those kind of fly patterns as long as they have movement to them or they got a lot of shine and flash like a bait fish you're going to be pretty successful and I'll, I'll just plug the uh, the fundraiser that's coming up. Both uh, Jeffrey Delia and Bob Triggs have donated flies that they tied. Um, so those are uh, certainly some um, some options for people to win. And I know Jeff, I, was, I thought Jeff was going to send us some of his Delia squids, but he sent me um, a dozen uh, new flies that he's been working on with written instructions um, on how he fishes them, which I'm not going to share now. So the lucky winner will get to get to get those and and Jeff's uh, special instructions. So um, that's something to look forward to. Um, another question, sort of about what they eat, is um, how often do they eat worms? Well, polychaete worms is one of their primary one of their primary uh, food sources when when small fish are not around. So the polychaete worm is. Uh, if people don't know it, you can look it up. It, it looks like a giant centipede, got a millipede, I guess. It's got a whole bunch of egg, a whole bunch of legs on it. Has a couple. Of, it spawns when it spawns. It's kind of got a greeny body with a red, with a kind of a red dot on it. We tie a pattern up for that. It's free floating at that point in time, and you'll really see cutthroat school up when that when it spawns. Uh, but other times when it comes out, you know they're 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 plying the bottom, as you know. They they love to. But they're not a deep water fish. They want to be where they can see what's on the bottom as well as what's on top of the water. Certainly in the fall, of course, you know, you can throw stimulators, especially at high tide underneath underneath overhanging trees and that type of stuff. If you want to cast some type of a floating stimulator or even a meal, you know, a, a popper or something like that, they they're not they're not adverse from coming up on top. But they love to be on the bottom looking around that's down there for something to eat. And when polychaete worms come out. Believe me, I've, I've caught cutthroat that have disgorged almost a whole polychaete worm that I think if you unraveled it, it'd be twice as long as the fish. <laughs> there's a, there's cool. a few different patterns for that. Uh, one that you use a kind of a hollow tubing material and you inject baby baby oil in it. It's kind of a complicated pattern and, and then it's got a hackle wound around it. And... Uh, it's really, really effective. The only problem is, is that their teeth will per they, they, it perforates the tubing and the oil goes out of it. And so you, you have to re you keep retying that fly a little bit. So I've, I'm I'm thinking about how to try tie that with a something that has the same shininess of that, but uh, is a lot is a is a lot more durable. But but certainly polychaete worms is something that they eat a lot of. That's cool. Um, I have a question for you. Um, 
you know, I feel like when we see beginners that are interested in learning to do sea run cut fishing, um, it's kind of overwhelming for, I feel like for people. And there's a lot of posts about people being like, I went out and I tried fishing for them and I couldn't find them. And I was wondering if you were to give uh, a couple tips um, to people that were just starting out or wanted to try it for the first time, what would you tell them to do? And I know that's probably a really big question, but if you could give like one or two things that to help them sort of narrow down where they're fishing. Sure. Uh, so there's, there, you know, there's two, two really important things on fishing for cutthroat and Puget Sound, you know, on the beach or in a boat. And if people are really interested in cutthroat and want to kind of just catch one and get enthused about it, we've got a we've got a really pretty good guide community. And some of these guys are really, really conservationists. I mean, almost every one of them has helped the coalition, is willing to help the coalition, has donated trips. And uh, they can they're gonna put you on they're gonna put you on fish. Now you're you're probably not gonna get on you're not going to be able to fish areas unless you have a boat as well and uh, you want to run around as much as they do. Uh, but certainly cutthroat fishing out of a boat is much, much more productive. Cutthroat fishing off a beach is a real challenge because like what we've been able to find is, is that they don't populate all beaches. Now that's not to say that you cannot find the odd fish here or there as they're moving around but as far as populations that are on a beach and that's where they live and you know they've got pit tags in them or they've got foy tags in them so we know that's an actual characteristic trying to find those beaches is really hard uh and uh, like i said you can have multiple beaches that look the same and why they're on one beach and why they're not on an, an identical beach it's really really hard to say but I would, I would look, I, if I didn't have a boat and I didn't, wasn't going to go out with a guide, I would certainly look for access points where you could get on the, on the salt water. And so you're looking at state parks and county parks and that type of stuff. I would recommend uh, Richard Stoll's new, bo new book. It, it's, uh, uh, it's out now. It's been out for a while. It's called Sea Run cutthroat trout sea run cutthroat trout by richard stoll last name is s-t-o-l-l -L. he's a longtime fishery scientist he's a great fisherman uh, people know richard for a long time his book will give you patterns uh it'll tell you tides it'll give you a ton of information but one of the things it does it gives you locations and Richard was telling me one time that he got an awful lot of grief after he published his book because people said, you're publicizing all these places to fish. Well, his comeback was, is they're all state parks primarily. So I'm not giving anybody secrets aware. So he has a section on the North Sound. He's got a section on the Middle Sound. He's got a section on the South Sound. And uh, so these, these beaches all produce cutthroat trout at different times of the year. They can be productive to a large degree, and they can be incredibly frustrating because the, the fish just move and they're just not around all the time. But uh, what, what I would certainly do if, for, if somebody was new, I'd go to a fly shop and I'd say, I'd like, I'd like to fish for cutthroat trout. What kind of patterns do I need? Is there any area that's near here? And all the fly shops will certainly guide people to where they need to go, whether it's Orvis and Belfair, Belver, Bellevue, or uh, Dave McCoy shop in West Seattle, or Gig Harbor Fly Shop, or Puget Sound Fly Shop, or uh, the Avid Angler, or Waters West. Uh, all those folks are all great supporters, and they're they're happy to have people experience catching this fish, and they'll tell you where to go. But then it just takes time to go out and 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 put the time in. Just remember a few different things. These are, are not a deep water fish. So if you're wading out chest high and casting another 20 or 30 feet, don't be surprised if you're not catching anything because a lot of times the fish are behind you. So they like small water. Uh, when I approach a beach all the time, I will always cast not from the water. I'll cast from, from the beach itself and I'll cast horizontally up and down the beach. 
a number of times and then work the fly out a ways. And I very seldom ever more than knee deep ever fishing for cutthroat trout. So uh, don't don't think you have to cast a long ways, but find a beach, go to a state park. The other thing that's really important is to try to learn a, a particular beach. So go there at low tide uh, and look and see what the beach looks like. Are there little depressions? Are there rocks? Are there drop-offs? Uh, and see what it looks like. And then as the tide comes in, that's going to change, and it's going to uh, and, and out and out out outbound as well. And so just remember also that these fish aren't they're not they're not like salmon that very often. So when the when the chum fry are doing their deal and other outbound uh, salmonoids are doing their deal, sure they'll gang up on and that stuff. But other times they're hiding and they're they're below a little drop off or a little rock or an undulation in the ground and they're waiting for something to go by they like moving water they like the bait moved quite quickly uh that's not to say that you won't catch fish in deep water i've got a friend who, who's an incredible fisherman down here in tacoma uh, guide wise uh and he fishes with clients in exclusively sinking lines in, in fairly deep water and really really fast retrieves and is in is really really successful uh but yeah. most of the time most of the time they're in they're in shallow water find a public beach go out try it look at different times of the tide make sure you're fishing moving water cool that's great uh great info i think we've got uh two more questions here um one is the uh the largest fish that i've caught have smaller spots overall and are mostly ab only above the lateral line is there any evidence of hybrid cuts with steelhead well again i, I would if, if james was on the call with us he'd probably give you a lot more of a scientific answer answer than that i i i certainly there certainly is hybridization between cutthroat and rainbow trout in a lot of the you know western rivers like with with uh Yellowstone cutthroat and rainbows, or with West Slope cutthroat and rainbows, and certainly to some degree some some coastal cutthroat and rainbows. Uh, supposedly, science-wise, is if they do if they if they do interbreed, then then they they're sterile and they can't they can't continue to make that off that that hybrid keep going. Uh, and spot pattern-wise, is that. You know, when we're taking our marine samples, like in the Big Fjord project right now, we're, you know, we take genetic samples, we take scale samples, we measure those fish, and then we photograph them. And uh, I should have paused a little bit earlier in one of the slides when we were showing different fish. They look, they look different from stream to stream to stream. Even down in the deep south sound, McLean Creek fish and, and, and uh, Kennedy Creek fish look different. We were in the canal getting samples uh in last march and the fish that we caught out of tarbu bay which we were assuming until we do the genetics but we're assuming they come out of tarbu creek the spot pattern on those fish looked more like tiger trout than it did anything resembling a coastal cutthroat trout the spots from basically just in front of the dorsal fin all the way to the caudal fin or the tail uh almost were worm-like like like, uh, like like brook trout they they were amazingly wow. different looking so you're going to see variations and patterns they always say that coast the cutthroat trout never have spots below the lateral line but we've got zillions of pictures i'm looking at bob stool's book right now and evidently that big cutthroat didn't get the message because he's got cut spots all the way down to his belly so uh you're certainly going to see a variation in 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 in, in spot patterns, right? Um, another question about beaches, and there's sort of two um, questions here around the same thing. But is the common wisdom to concentrate on cobble beaches versus sandy beaches accurate? Well, yes, absolutely. So. Uh, that's not to say they aren't in sandy beaches because they'll be on sandy beaches a lot a lot of times with eel grass so if sandy beaches have eel grass there's a lot of stuff lives in the eel grass and they'll certainly cruise through around that and they'll cruise through around that they'll be on kind of muddy beaches like in the deep south sound there are some specific beaches that are muddy i mean too dangerous to walk fish type muddy 
but they have a, an incredible popular population of ghost shrimp and when they come out these fish just gorge on them so they will cruise around that to eat uh, but they also seem to leave that but what these fish do like they like cobble they like cobble they like oyster beds uh, they like stuff where there are little critters to eat whether that's cocoa pods amphipods you know little shrimp you know free floating crabs all that kind of stuff is more in those kind of little rock areas because it gives it gives that type of uh lower part of the food chain places to live so certainly and in and bigger rocks as well so not only just cobble but if there are bigger rocks on an outgoing incoming tide they like to hide behind that just like they hide behind a rock in the stream so certainly cobble beach versus sand beach if i if if i you know if i how to fish a beach i would certainly fish an unknown cobble beach before i'd ever fish a supposedly productive sand beach i i just uh i did i personally just haven't caught all that many fish on them well, like i said oh certainly casting into a, a sand beach that's got uh, uh that's got eelgrass on it as the tide's coming in especially over eelgrass you can certainly throw into into the eelgrass and, and see if they're cruising around in there. But they they certainly seem to when we're out beach singing and, and trying to find different beaches to sing to, to, to try to get more fish tagged, uh, we're never we're never seen in we're never seen in a, 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 a sandy type beach. Well, I think that's it for questions. There's a lot of people thanking you for taking time out and uh, and spending the evening chatting with us. Um, mm -hmm. And, and this was a lot of fun yeah, and, I, and i appreciate everybody listening for putting up with the initial uh, technical difficulties that we had um, exactly. but uh <laughs> anyways so, this was really cool well i really appreciate the opportunity you, you know everybody's financial support over the last number of years is you, we just can't thank people enough uh, like i said our goal is to try to find out the population of this fish so that we can manage it uh for the long term we just don't want it to we don't want it to go the way of steelhead and 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 listed species of 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 salmon you know it's kind of the ultimate survivor it's been around for a long time no matter seems what we seem to do with it uh it seems to kind of keep hanging on but i think if we uh, manage it properly and realize the benefit that it has you know people talk about opportunity and catch and release and well why can't we kill it you know i grew up fishing them and then we kate we killed them and we ate them and and i did too and you know in the 50s and the 60s i did the same darn thing but uh yeah, i think we're a little bit more enlightened in 2022 uh, people will go to wyoming montana and idaho and oregon and and not even think about killing the fish but when i give presentations people will say how come i can't you know catch them keep them and so normally I ask them to just wait till we're done with the presentation. And when we're done, they normally come up and say, well, I, I get why we don't want to kill them anymore. So uh, uh, we just want to have that fish around for everybody who's listening and for their kids and their grandkids and and, and on and on and on. So uh, again, your financial support is wonderful. Please uh, check out this, the, the Instagram site. There's stuff being put on there all the time. Go to the website if you have questions. Uh, they all come to me. So feel free to to, to go to the website and and uh, look at the papers and more of the stuff that's going on that we've done and we're going to be rebuilding that this year as well so that should be exciting and uh, again thanks everybody for 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 loving this fish and 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 helping out uh, financially because uh, uh, without you we wouldn't be able to uh, do any of the science that that we do so thanks thanks so much great thank you everyone for coming uh, keep your uh... Keep your social media eyes out for announcement for when we're going to start fundraising and when uh, and when we get that started. So we've got a lot of cool stuff that uh, companies um, have supported this, and I look forward to uh, to to sharing it with you guys. So, anyways, thanks again, Greg, and everybody have a good evening, and thanks for joining and and making this a fun time. All the best, everybody. Good fishing. Okay.